Welcome to AccuConnect 2023, everyone. Are you all as excited for the next couple of days of learning everything you ever wanted to know about Acumatica and more? I sure hope you are. Uh, go ahead and drop in the chat what you are most excited about for this year's event. We also have a poll question to ask um, if this is your first time attending or maybe your fourth. Currently, it looks like we're sitting at about 56% of you are first time attendees. Welcome, thank you for being here. Uh, and we have around 12% that this is their fourth time and have been with us year over year. Uh, I also would love to understand what you guys are most excited about for this year's event. So go ahead and drop that in the chat today and let us know what you're most excited about learning about. I know for me, I'm most excited about the educational sessions as well as the networking opportunities. My name is Liz Anderson and I am the current President Board for AccuConnect, and I am joined on the stage by Amy Keenan, the Vice President of the Board. This year's event is jam-packed full of educational sessions from subject matter experts, fun networking opportunities, and tons of opportunities for you to download content and continue the learning after this mm -hmm. week's event. I want to kick things off by first thanking our sponsors. Without them, we wouldn't be able to make this event possible. You are all able to attend today for free because of their generosity and for support of the community. Our gold sponsors are going to be presenting dedicated sessions over the next two days to share and expand how you can leverage their enhanced solutions to expand your Acumatica investment. Thank you, gold sponsors. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I also want to take a minute to thank our silver sponsors who will also be presenting concurrent sessions over the next two days to help deepen your Acumatica knowledge. And our bronze sponsors can be found in the Expo Hall, as well as sponsoring some of our educational sessions. Don't forget that because this is a virtual event, we have a fun expo that's virtual where you can interact with our sponsors. You can find content that they're providing for you to learn more about their solutions and even enter some, to uh, win some exciting and fun prizes. So please be sure to stop by thank our sponsors for sponsoring and learn more about what they have to offer. If this is your first time uh, joining an AccuConnect community event, and it sounds like we've got over 50% of you that fall into that bucket, our mission is to provide the Acumatica community members, including VARs, ISVs, and M users like you with a network for education, shared resources, and collaboration. AccuConnect was originally founded back in 2018 as a grassroots effort from dedicated Acumatica Channel veterans. And we had such tremendous uh, growth over those years that we officially incorporated in 2021 as a nonprofit organization. So I wanna take this opportunity to introduce you to our current board. Many of these faces may look familiar, some of them may look new, and some of them you might notice are even missing. And so on that note, I just want to take a minute to pause and thank Nicole Ronchetti, our outgoing board president, for her dedication over the last few years to get the community to where it is today. As the new incoming board president for AccuConnect, I know I have big shoes to fill, um, but I'm up for the challenge. I've been part of it as a founding member from the beginning and I'm really excited to help take the board to the next level and into the future. I also wanna give a welcome to Mike Nottley. He is our most recent board member and he comes to us from a dedicated Acumatica VAR in the community. And obviously Amy, Louisa, Darcy, Johnny, thank you guys for all of your advisory insights to help us grow the community, securing sponsorships, as well as helping us secure speakers over the years for our educational sessions. And I also, I'm gonna take a quick minute to do a shout out to Darcy Borio. Without her, this event would not yes. be uh, possible, <laughs> including um, our sponsorship, but she had managed all the sponsorships for the event over the last couple of months, has worked tirelessly behind the scenes to give us, um, manage all the logistics to get this event to today and make it a success. So thank you, Darcy, we appreciate you. Um, and we couldn't do it without you. And Amy also, thank you for helping to onboard all of our presenters this week so that they make sure that they can present without a hitch as they go through their sessions. I also wanna take a minute to talk about our committees. We are a 100% volunteer driven community 
And it isn't without our community members that we are committee members that we could make what we provide to you today successful. And so we've got two very active committees. The first one is the events and webinar committee. They are responsible for managing all of our monthly educational sessions, our sponsor sessions, and putting together fun networking opportunities like our happy hour. Our social media committee is also out there making sure that we're spreading the word digitally to drive more members to the community so everybody is aware of everything that we have available. Um, you've probably seen the LinkedIn takeover over the last month or so with our blue and gold branding. Um, so thank you guys for driving everybody here today to make this event a success. So I want to just give a few updates on what's new with AccuConnect. As I mentioned, we are currently set up as a nonprofit and we will continue to run as a nonprofit. We are set up as a 501c6. We have recently added new board members and we also updated our elected officers in July. We continue to experience growth with community volunteers. There should be a chat uh, link in the chat for you if you're interested in joining as a volunteer. Um, to throw your name in the hat so that we can contact you after this week's event to get you more involved. But we're excited to announce that we are launching three new committees. Uh, they revolve around technology, content, and outreach. And these are areas that we feel are going to be important to help grow the community long term and to provide features that will drive more subscribers and members to our community to help continue to provide more value. And last but not least, I'm excited to announce that we are taking a lot of our sponsorship in, uh, sponsorship funds and reinvesting them in the community to refresh our website before the end of the year. Uh, Brian Dunn and Epic Sky Marketing currently manage our web properties. They've been interest, instrumental in helping us to map out our website refresh, and we're excited to showcase that for all of you in the months to come. So stay tuned more for that um, in the months to come. As a board member, I often get asked, who should join AccuConnect? And I think that this graph is a great depiction that shows everybody should join the community. We have subscribers that are broken out pretty evenly, a third, a third, a third. We've got a third that are VARs, a third that are ISVs, and another third that make up end user customers. We also have some Acumatica employees who are subscribers as well as what we call Acumatica influencers. These are third party organizations that help spread the word about Acumatica and get um, others involved to share the knowledge about our community. We actually, actually, we also actually have a few Acumatica prospective customers. And so if that happens to be you, I hope that you find from this event, this, these next two days, that this is the ERP for you and you officially decide to join as an Acumatica customer and become a long-term AccuConnect community subscriber. I also wanna give a few updates on stats for 2023. We typically update these stats twice a year. Uh, we do it once at this event, and then we also do it for our session at Acumatica uh, Summit in, in January. If you haven't thought about attending that in the past, I highly encourage you to do that as well. That's a great in-person op person opportunity for you to learn more about Acumatica. Um, but I want to just give a quick update on a few of these stats. The first one is my most exciting one to talk about today, which shows that our total website page views are up 301%. And this is before we've even relaunched our website. So um, I'm expecting that number to continue to grow as we add some additional SEO to drive more organic growth to the community in the future. Our unique total page views are up 20%, sitting at around 23,000. Our total subscribers are also up 23%. I would imagine after this week's event, we'll be at over 1,500. Our highest page views for a blog this last 12 months was 824. And you're hearing it here first. We are officially exceeding registration from last year, and we are sitting at around 550 plus registrations for AccuConnect 2023. So thank you all for taking time out of your busy days to join us for this event these next two days and to help us um, you know, exceed the registration from last year and make this event even more successful. And we continue to get excited for more growth in the future. 
Amy, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you for some good updates on housekeeping so everybody knows how to navigate through the platform this week. Sure. And I feel like since we have almost half of them being new people joining us for this event, we definitely need some housekeeping items, but I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with our hop in platform. So as you're logged in today, you're here in the stage, which is where the keynotes happen, but the reception area is where you can see the agenda, everything that's going on for the day, the sponsors and so forth. And the stage will be the keynotes. So make sure, as you know, we're here for the keynote today and our keynote tomorrow. Sessions, you will find them all in the sessions tab. And just so you know, you will not see sessions until 10 minutes before they start. So don't be alarmed if you don't see the session that you want to attend there yet. It will show up 10 minutes before the start time. It gives time for our speakers to get in there, get set up and so forth. And then throughout the day, if you have time, you can certainly network with others throughout the event. It's kind of like a speed dating where you click on it and it will match you with somebody else and you get to talk to them for roughly three minutes before they sh shut you off and move you on to another person. So just be aware of that. It's happened to me where I was having a conversation in mid sentence just got cut off. So just be aware that it will end after a certain time. And then of course, as Liz mentioned, the expo. So make sure you go and visit all of our sponsors, check out their booths. And we will talk a little bit about the prizes that they have available, but they have a lot of great content out there that they can want to share with you. Now we get to some chat tips. And I know the chat has been going blown up since we started in the event chat. It was great to see everybody from all different countries joining us today. So thank you. That is the main event chat. That is where we'll have all our main event messaging going on throughout today. So make sure you check that. There's also separate booth chat, session chat, and direct chat. So when you're in the booth, certainly you can interact with those that you are visiting in the expo area. If you wanna ask them a question, if you wanna say hi, if you wanna chat with them, if you wanna get more information, feel free to engage with our sponsors there. For the sessions, there's also a dedicated chat. All attendees in that session will be able to see and interact in that chat. There's a separate Q&A tab for the session as well. So when you do have questions, you can put it in that versus in the chat. And then there's direct chat. So you can certainly see people that you want to engage with throughout the event. Just message them, say hi. You can do even do a video chat. So there's lots of ways to network and get yourself involved in today and tomorrow event. And as I mentioned, visit the Expo sponsors. There is really no dedicated time today so, and tomorrow. So make sure you visit them anytime throughout the event. It will be open. Uh, basically, first come, first serve. Just go out there and interact and learn more about them. Again, we mentioned they have prizes they, they're going to be sharing. And you want to connect with them one-on-one -on -one there. That's the best opportunity to do so is to go to the Expo and visit them in the booth to be able to chat with them there. And um, sometimes you can even um, do some polls there. So there's a lot of interaction in that virtual expo hall. So prizes, Liz, you get to talk about that. <laughs> I will, and I'm just gonna make a quick comment about um, networking because Darcy, or um, we, Amy, you had mentioned that we have a lot of networking opportunities, but we have, I think, four plus continents, maybe five, mm -hmm. <laughs> that are here today. So there's tons of opportunities to network globally. We've got people from North America, Europe, Asia, Africa. I think we've got maybe some uh, people from Australia rejoining as well. So if you are out there, um, this has really become a global community. And so um, that's pretty exciting. But take advantage of those opportunities to network with everybody across all continents today. Yeah, um, so exciting. yes, prizes. <laughs> We have lots of sponsors giving away prizes. There is going to be a link in the chat that you can go and find out where you can enter in to win some of these prizes. Um, these are offered by our sponsors. Some of them are giving them away at their sessions over the next two days. So you'll need to attend to be entered to win for some of those. Others have prizes being given away in their virtual booth. And others are using polls to... Uh, get people to answer some questions that they maybe want to know from the community mm -hmm. um, and then I'll pick a winner from that. So be sure to leverage all the different ways that you can get involved and share your expertise um, so that you have the opportunity to walk away with some fun prizes this week as well. And don't forget that at the end of today, we have a networking happy hour for everybody um, that is going to be sponsored by AccuConnect. 
and it's going to be hosted at 4 50 p.m eastern time you will access that by going to the sessions tab at that time and clicking on that happy hour session uh, we're going to be having a fun acumatica trivia game and i am excited to see everybody's acumatica trivia knowledge and we will be giving away a couple gift cards to amazon for the top two winners uh, valuing up to 200 dollars. so uh, we hope to see you all there and um, take that opportunity to network outside of the sessions today and with that amy i'm going to turn it over to you so we can officially get kicked off with Yay. our opening keynote Woohoo! So today we're so excited to have Ed Quest for day one. And tomorrow to wrap it all up, this amazing event, we have John Case. So you will find both of them in the stage where we are located now. So make sure you join us for, of course, our opening keynote and our closing keynote. So very excited to have them both here to present. And of course, spread the love during these events and follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, share the hashtag, tag us in LinkedIn. We'd love to see and share and hear all of the amazing things you're learning, pictures, posts, uh, sessions that you're attending. Feel free to be able to spread the word because that's how we grow our community as well. So please make sure you do that. And with that, we are now going to oh, say thank you to Paya, who is our keynote sponsor for kicking off day one of AccuConnect. So thank you so much, Paya, for being our keynote speaker today. We truly do appreciate it. And with that, I get to introduce Ed Kless. He is a co-host for the Voice America Talk Show Networks, The Soul of Enterprise with Ron Baker. He's the founder of the Verisage Institute, where Ed is also a senior fellow. He co-authored The Soul of Enterprise, Dialogues on Business and the Knowledge Economy, and he is a contributor to industry publications, has spoken at many conferences worldwide on project management, pricing, and knowledge workers. He's active in the Information Technology Alliance, also known as ITA. He's been named to accounting today's list of the most of 100 most influential people in accounting numerous times, including 2022. Additionally, Ed is a faculty member of the Professional Pricing Society. So welcome, Ed. Thank you so much for being our speaker today and kicking off AccuConnect 2023. We truly do appreciate it. Well, Amy, thank you for having me. Thanks, Liz, and the, the board of uh, AccuConnect for inviting me to the show. So I'm looking forward to sharing some, uh, sh sharing some knowledge, sharing some information. I love doing this. So thanks. Well, uh, I see some familiar faces out there in the, the chat as well as on, on the board. So uh, I, many of you know me, but for those of you who don't, I am Ed Kless. You can get a hold of me by just finding, searching Ed Kless. My parents were really into differentiation. So I am the only Ed Kless in the world pretty easy to find me. Uh, but at Ed Kless is, a, uh, is, is the place to go. Uh, I'll be mentioning this uh, again a little bit later, but I also, as mentioned, do host a radio show with Ron Baker called The Soul of Enterprise. So I'd love for you to get a chance to check that out. It's a radio show slash podcast, uh, but that's the, the only commercial you're going to get from, from me on that. Um, so let's let's jump in. I've got some some really fun stuff that I want to share with, with the group. So uh, let's talk about this concept of innovation beyond technology. I came across this quote, I, hes I hesitate to say this, more than 30 years ago, but it's really stood the test of time. And that is the only sustainable competitive advantage is an organization's ability to out-innovate the competition. Uh, this can be challenging, especially for those of us who work with accountants, because innovative accounting will land you in jail. Uh, so we don't want to innovate around uh, accounting so much. But I, I do think that we have gotten stuck in a a, a place where we think that innovation has to be around some kind of a technological uh, innovation. You know, the of course, stuff like the iPod, right? Or iPad, uh, any, any of the iDevices out there. But uh, just to differentiate, an invention is something that is completely new. Let's talk about uh, a keyboard, let's say. The first time that someone created a, 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 key, a stringed instrument that was, that made sound by striking a key that hit a hammer, that was an invention. Everything after that, including the keyboard that I have over here from Casio, is, a, is an innovation because what it's taking is different disparate ideas and putting them together. 
And I like to think of it this way, is that uh, innovations, and this is a quote from Matt Ridley, science author and a member of the House of Lords, believe it or not, but uh, he's written several books on the concept of innovation. And he talks about innovation as when ideas have sex. Now, it, it, this is a, a, a biological concept, but this is, a, I think, just a great example of this, right, is this a little innovation that I wish I had when my son and daughter were, were younger, uh, and that is uh, a skateboard that's attached to a stroller. Uh, so that the older kid can ride along rather than hang on the side of the stroller like my kids did and drove me crazy, right? So like pulling all over the all over the place. So uh, I think my relationship with my son would be a little bit better. But if you just think about this, what Matt Ridley is saying here is that, well, if a stroller and a skateboard fell in love, you know, this this would be the result, right? Is the, this combination of two sometimes disparate ideas. Um, it, it, and I think that it, it, the, the danger here, again, is that in the, in the accounting space, in the IT space, we're so caught up in uh, technology. But I do want to share with you what, with what I think has been, uh, it, over the course of my career, the, 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 by far the most uh, adopted innovation in the accounting space. Uh, and it's, it's, it's really truly transformative. And that is the switch from the uh, customer bringing the receipts in a shoebox to bringing them in a Ziploc bag. I mean, I think that, that we can all admit, this is actually my slide. I really, this is my receipts from uh, several years ago. So, um, you know, I, when, I, when I showed this, they're like, oh yeah, that's absolutely true. Uh, but I think what we have to do is how can we get off this? And what I wanna share with you today is some concepts around innovation that are not directly tied to technology. And why is this so important? Well, because the biggest innovation is around business models. And here's a guy that you would think from a technological perspective anyway, certainly founder of, of uh, Intel, Andy Grove. He said, disruptive threats come inherently not from new technology, but from new business models. Now, this is a guy who his business came out with a new product that made this stuff that they made 18 months ago completely obsolete. Take yourself through that. I mean, imagine if every 18 months there was something that we, that we were delivering to customers that, compl that made our old product completely obsolete. We, I don't even know if we can process that, right? Um, but that's what this guy did. But he wasn't, but he said, it's not about the innovation. It's not about the technology itself, but it was about the business model that evolved. I'll give you a quick example of this. Uh, and then we'll, then we'll talk about several examples and how they might pertain to you and your customers. Uber. Um, Uber, I think, is a great example of innovation because they, this was not just this was, you know, poly ideas coming together. This was many, many ideas. This is the, the cell phone, the GPS, uh, the internet, um, the, the, the ability to transact, process transactions in the background. All of these different things coming together in one place. But I think that the biggest innovation that Uber made, and test this out for yourselves, was the fact that when we were waiting for the Uber we got a countdown and knew exactly when the driver was going to show up with the car. And it was like seven minutes, six minutes, five minutes, four minutes. And you get that countdown to see and progress is being made. When they first put this out, they were, uh, that was among the first systems that had that. And why it was so important is because we as human beings would much rather know how long the wait is going to be even if on average the wait is a little bit longer. I'll say that again. We would rather know exactly how long the wait is, even though the wait might be a little bit longer and it be some unknown time, I'm not exactly sure when on average. And that's what Uber delivered to us. And if you think about it, I've, I've been in to, to, uh, uh, pu on public transportation across the world last week, uh, two weeks ago, I was in Atlanta and the MARTA, you know, I was taking the MARTA up to, to Buckhead and sure, sure enough, there's a countdown that says, you know, next train in four minutes, next train in three minutes, next train in two minutes. And New York City subway is the same thing. All of these different places have now added this feature that we 
or learn to expect from Uber, and it's really become ubiquitous. And I think that was one of the the, the big changes that, that uh, they, they blew out for us, which I, I think is great. But what I want to do is spend the balance of our time. We got about twenty minutes or so left here. I want to share with you just some different um, innovations that I have come across, uh, and I, and explain how I think that these are these are some practical things that, that you can per perhaps put into into practice in your business. So the first one I want to share is an innovation around pricing. Now, for those of you who know me, know I'm not going into value pricing, not going into subscription, not yet, not yet anyway, perhaps a little bit, uh, in a little bit. But this innovation around pricing to me is just incredible. This was uh, the, the car company Audi uh, and or Audi. And this was test marketed in two cities in northern Germany. And here's what they did. Uh, they were sitting around thinking that, you know, it's end of year and they wanted to sell some more cars. So the finance people got out their spreadsheets and they, you know, put the numbers in and they said, all right, we're going to offer a 3000 euro or dollar discount off the price of the car. And one of the guys on the team was a behavioral economist. We'll talk a little bit more about them in a second, but he said, well, can't we do better? And, you know, the finance people look at each other and said, well, 4,000 would be better, but if we put 4,000 in our spreadsheets break, right? So it's not, we can't do that. All right. So, so it's gotta be 3,000. He says, no, 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 no. He says, what if instead of $3,000 off the sticker price of the car, we took, we gave them $3,000 on top of their trade-in bonus. Finance people look at each other and they say, it's the same thing. And he says, it's the same thing if you're a finance person, just not if you're a human being, right? So it's a different thing because this is what's known as the framing effect or anchoring effect. The anchor price of the $34,000 car, the discount is 3,000, which is slightly less than 10%. But if we look at it in terms of, well, I'm trading my car in for, let's say, $7,000, and I'm getting an additional $3,000 on top of the price of the trade-in for the car, it looks like a better deal. And by the way, when they test marketed this in two cities in northern Germany, it accounted for the additional 20,000 cars being sold, one city versus the other. And that's incredible. Uh, so question is, okay, well, that, that's nice, Ed, but what does this car have to do with what, 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 what I do? Well, I don't know. Do you guys uh, sometimes put in new technology and are trying to get people to switch, you know, tech stacks from one to the other? Right? Yeah. Um, perhaps what you could do is say, well, here's what we'll do. We won't give you a discount, but what we will do is we will buy your old system from you when you have completely cut over and agree that you're live on the new system, on the new technology. So we're not going to give you a discount, but we're going to buy the old system from then. And I want you to have to, you're going to write a check, right? You have to write a check or ACH or whatever, but it has to be, we're going to get not a credit. We're going to give you money. <laughs> Uh, put it in a FedEx envelope and send it FedEx and make a big deal out of it or, or pre present it, you know, get one of those big checks that you, you know, uh, that, that, you, that you see on TV all the time, right? Uh, bring it with you and make and give them because now think about this. One of the things that this does is in addition to not having it as a discount reflected as a discount. And by the way, you can, you can account for it in your pricing up front. Uh, but it also gives them incentive to say yes we're live on the new technology stack. Because in order to get the money, they have to say, yes, we're live on it. So anyway, I, I think this is a, a, an interesting idea. I have worked with some partner organizations that have tried this and they say, it works great. Just works absolutely great. So uh, give it a shot. Uh, Next, I want to talk to you about innovating around experience. Now, um, I do a lot of speaking for, for in, in professional organizations, especially around accountants um, and accounting things related. Uh, for some reason, accountants love to go to Las Vegas. Uh, this is the uh, Aria Hotel and the, the lobby at the Aria Hotel. Lovely, lovely, lovely place. I've been there twice already this year, going back two more times between now and the end of the year. So, you know, uh, my home away from home in Las Vegas. But uh, this is a, a picture that I grabbed off of the Aria Hotels website. Um, this was uh, two years ago. Actually, it was pre-COVID. My actual check-in experience at the Aria Hotel, I don't know if you can see this, but there's the, uh, the, the, the pink wall there, okay? Um, it took me an hour and 15 minutes to check in. One hour 
and 15 minutes to check in. This was not a good experience. Now, what's weird about this is that hotel after hotel after hotel has done studies that show that the number one predictable feature around whether or not you're going to like the hotel is the check-in experience. So if you are going to invest in anything in, uh, from a customer experience standpoint, you own a hotel, you want it to be your check-in experience because it, cre it, it creates a, a, a bias toward confirmation bias toward the rest of the stay. So if you show up, it takes you less than five minutes to check in, you're back up in your room, fantastic. You look around and go, wow, that ice sculpture is lovely. Look at these shops there. I love the shopping in this place. If you have a terrible check-in experience like I do, I did, you're walking around going, look at that ice sculpture, it's melting, All right? So it's, we're colored by the fact that we had this initial experience. Lesson, of course, is really stick your landing on your whatever your opening is with a particular customer. And this can even go roll it back to the prospect when they're prospects, right? Stick the landing. May, overwhelm them with your genius, uh, especially up front in, in kickoff or, uh, or, or you know, scoping meetings, really have your stuff together so that they're like, wow, these people know what they're doing. So that, because it, now this doesn't mean you can abuse them from here on in after that. That's not, not necessarily the case. I know that for certain that's not the case, but uh, what you do want to do is make sure that you get that, that opening done quite well. Um, next, I want to talk about innovation around packaging. And I love throwing this one out because th this is a great uh, idea for a Harvard uh, case uh, study. Harvard business case study. So if you're going to release a drink that's going to compete with Coca-Cola, which is, you know, sit, ar sit, sit around and let's brainstorm on what we might do if we're going to compete with Coca-Cola. All right, well, we've got we've to put something together that, you know, uh, what we'll try to do is we'll get something that's got to taste great. It's got to be fantastic, absolutely delicious, because Coke is pretty, pretty tasty, lots of sugar in it. We've got to figure out what we're going to do to make it taste great. Next, maybe what we can do is uh, lower the price, you know, get in there, undercut Coke, and that'll establish a beachhead. We'll use our, our, our pricing, uh, penetration pricing, get in there, establish that, and then we'll maybe raise the price later. So we'll make it cheaper. Maybe we can give them more, too. We can make the, the, the package even bigger. Right, we'll we'll make it bigger, and and it'll be good. We'll, instead of a, a twelve ounce can, we'll give them a sixteen ounce can. Okay, that may might work, but then take yourself how this company made it successful. You know, <laughs> first of all, they sit around and said, you know what, let's make it taste like crap. All right. Um, by the way, I don't understand the whole uh, Red Bull vodka mixture. I mean, isn't that what Elvis died of? Anyway, um, so I don't I don't want to get get that. So it tastes awful. Um, it's expensive as all get out, three, four, or five times the price of a Coke in some cases. And the key, they made the package smaller. Why? Because they created a different category. It wasn't a soft drink. It was an energy drink. It's right on the label there, energy drink. And I can imagine the conversation with the finance team going, finance people, hey, can we just use standard 12-ounce cans? You know, we need to go to market with this thing. We need to get this out into the marketplace. Uh, why are we having custom cans made for our drink? And fortunately, the, the marketing team won out and figured out, no, 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 we're going to do this. It's going to be, be going to be different. All right. So that's another innovate around packaging. So how can you innovate around your packaging? What is your packaging? You have it. What is it? And I, you know, it's not, not forums and all, all that, but it is the way that you present yourself with your customers. So what is it? What is the packaging? What are you going to market with? What are you leading with? Are you leading with the fact that you are a, an expert in a particular system or a particular thing or a, or are you saying, no, 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 we're, we are project managers that happen to implement a technology. And I think there's a difference. There's a, a de definitely a positional difference between those two. Okay, um, I love this one. I'm going to talk about a guy named Rory Sutherland. Uh, and he's the one who came up with this. I think this is absolutely brilliant. He was, he, he was asked by the, uh, the health service in the UK, the National Health Service in the UK, to create an ad campaign. He, uh, Rory Sutherland is the, uh, the chair of Ogilvy and Mather in the UK. 
And uh, so they, they, they asked them, they said, we want an, an awareness campaign because people are not completing their course of antibiotic. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but this is a kind of a dangerous thing from a societal standpoint, because what we do or what we tend to do is we tend to get the prescription for antibiotic. Uh, it says take one pill a day for seven days. We take the first four, we feel better. And then we take the last three and we put them in a drawer and say, if we don't feel, uh, if we start feeling bad again, we'll finish taking them up. If not, we can save it for the next time. And I can maybe knock it out before I even need to go to back to the doctor. Now I know we've all done this. So the problem though is, is that most of the time, yes, you do get well after taking only the four pills. However, it takes longer for your body to knock out the total infection. And in the meantime, the bacteria that you are passing along to other people are the survival of the fittest ones that are stronger because they survived the first four days worth of anti antibiotics. And when then you pass that along to the next person, they, then they get this stronger strain of the of, of the bacteria and rinse and repeat. And now, um, not if you're aware, but we have to we have to start b building strong, bigger and stronger antibiotics. Sometimes to the point where, in some people, they just don't flat out don't work. So what they wanted to do is make sure, hey, we want people to complete their course of antibiotics. So we need a public awareness campaign. All right. So Rory Sutherland says, no, we don't think I don't think you need that. Mm -hmm. Well, we're coming to you, you're the advertising agency. This is why he says, yes, but I have a better idea. It won't cost you as, mu as much. And that is to change your customer usage. Instead of saying, here are seven pills, take one pill a day for seven days. We're going to make the, la the, the seventh pill blue and say, take the first, the six white pills, the first six days, and then the blue pill on the seventh day. Again, it's the same thing if you're Mr. Spock but not if you're Homer Simpson, mm, donuts, right? The com completely different. And what this is, is a process called chunking, where if we break something down into more than one step, it's more likely that we'll complete the course of antibiotics. Hmm. Weird, right? So how does this apply to you? Well, do you guys delegate anything? You guys delegate internally, maybe to people inside your organizations. Do you delegate back to customers things to do? Try it. Chunk it down for them. Create a two or sometimes even three. I wouldn't go more than three. Step process for what you're asking them to do. Do this, then that. Do this, then that. Now, this is not a panacea to complete the uh, medical analogy here, but what I've observed in my personal life and behavior is when I do this, it is more likely that the person completes the task that I've asked them to do when I break it down into a two-step process. I, I'm, I'm sample size of one. I get it. But give it a shot. Try it. See what happens. And, and uh, go from there. So innovating around the, cu the customer uses. Um, Love this next one. Uh, this is innovating around a customer focus process. You can look this one up. This is a, a, the, the $3 million continue button. And, and by the way, I do blame the accounting technology people for this one. Uh, because when, when we first put out e-commerce sites, the, what we did from a process standpoint is we mimicked the process in the background that went something like this. Well, I've got somebody who wants to place an order. Okay. Uh, so since they need to place an order, the first thing that we need to do is we need to create a customer so that once we have the customer information filled out, then we can go in and place an order in the order screen. Makes total sense from a back end perspective, makes zero sense from a front end perspective, because every single one of us, what was our behavior when we were presented with the fact that, OK, if you want to if you want to put something in your shopping cart, you first have to give us your customer information, your name, your address, your blood type, how many children you have, just all, all of this crazy kind of stuff. And then we're like back button on the browser. No, we don't want to buy from them. But as soon as it was flipped the other way, where we said, no. What we'll allow you to do is put stuff in your shopping cart first and then continue. It was okay then. Then we were like, yes, absolutely. I'd love to see what I could put in my shopping cart. And then I'm more than happy to then give you the information about me <laughs> once I've got stuff in the shopping cart that I want to buy. So again, $300 million continue button. You can take a, a look at that one. 
The last thing that I want to mention is a little bit odd, um, and that is innovating around language. Uh, I'm going to share this quote with you from Deirdre McCloskey, who is an economic historian uh, at, in the, at the uh, University of uh, Illinois. She said, and she's written a series of books called the Bourgeois Trilogy. This is the book that is up there called The Bourgeois Dignity, Why Economics Can't Explain the Modern World. The graph above it is just the explosive growth since 1800 uh, that we've seen. The entire uh, course of humanity before uh, 1800 was one of uh, life being nasty, brutish, and short, and subsistence two or three dollar a day living. Uh, and now the entirety of the world has come around. And she says that it wasn't the industrial revolution itself or was it wasn't technology that caused the industrial revolution it was a change in rhetoric around the around markets we started to instead of killing innovators which she documents in the book including a guy who in ancient rome uh, came up with essentially the formula for what we now know as corel you know the dishes that don't break or are very hard to break when you drop them uh, he came up with this, the, the, whatever that mix was of adding in, I don't know, pumice or what have you to the to the to the the ingredients list that made the 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 earthenware uh, almost unbreakable. They they, they killed him. <laughs> they killed him because they, they, they were afraid that he was going to uh, put all of the glaciers and stuff out of business. Uh, so instead of killing our innovators, we began to honor them, and we began to say that what what people who are innovating. Uh, we're not witches, which a lot of the, that was the other uh, 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 the indictment against them. But instead said, no, 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 these, these, these folks have something valid to offer. So what does that mean for us? Well, uh, what this guy says, uh, Werner Erhard, he's one of my heroes, by the way. If any of you saw watched the, the, uh, the TV show, uh, the, the Americans, um, that it, it was sort of featured in there. Philip, one of the, 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 the people in the Americans, he was, uh, he went to EST, EST, Earhart Seminar Training. This is uh, Werner Earhart. I, I, I like him for, he's a weird dude, by the way, a little kind of, kind of strange, a little wacky uh, for sure. But um, it, in addition to this great quote, which I'll share with you in just a second, where well, you can read it yourself, but he, he also won a tax case against the IRS. So <laughs> for that reason alone, uh, but he said, all transformation is linguistic. If we want to change our culture, we need to change our conversation. So what do I mean by that? I mean, let's literally begin to change language. And by the way, when I say literally, I actually mean literally, not figuratively. Um, so we want to change the language. So here's just some thoughts so that you don't have to adopt any or all of these. But I do want you to think about this, especially from when you're dealing with customers. Um, ch changing the idea of training to education. Don't, you don't train. We don't, no, we don't offer training. We offer education, product education. I don't care. Put an put a, put a, a, a adjective in front of it if you like. But children and horses and dogs are trained. We're potty trained. We train the dogs. Adult human beings are educated. Call it, but just from a marketing standpoint, what can, what can you theoretically charge more for, training or education? I think education is clearly the better word here. Uh, don't talk about fees or bills or cost. Talk about price, or in some people to call investment. Right? Don't 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 use the words. Um, this is one of my favorites. So I'm not going to go through all these, but instead of change orders, don't even talk about change orders. Always speak about change requests. We have to do a change request. Request for whatever reason. It, well, I know what the reason is, is that it, it's clearly, it clearly happens at first. We make the change request, and then the request can become a change order, just like a purchase request can become a purchase order, but has to go through an approval process. One of the things I think is detrimental is when we talk just purely about change orders, I find, I don't know, test, test this out in your mind, but 70 plus percent of change orders are usually stuff that's already been done that we now retrospectively have to go process a change order for, but the work is already done, <laughs> right? So once we agree to our scope, Anything that, that is a change to that has to go through a change request where it then can actually then flow through and maybe be put into a change order once it's approved by 
whoever needs to approve it. Um, the last one that I want to uh, just talk about here, and I got be I only had a minute left here, uh, but is I want you to stop worrying so much about your time capacity and worry more about your emotional capacity. Uh, I think that's an, an important distinction to make. I think we this is this is how we we survive burnout. Um, you know, we've all had that conversation with a customer in the morning. And we're done for the day. I mean, I, this happened to me a, a, a couple of months ago. I had this very difficult conversation with somebody early in the morning. And then, I, you know, like Facebook, here I come. I scrolled so far into Facebook, it became my space. It was weird. It was a certain point, just like flipped. It was being, no, I'm kidding. Uh, but w manage that emotional capacity. If you know that you're going to have be having difficult conversations, don't stack them one against uh, uh, one, one after the next, after the next, after the next. Make sure that you plan for that emotional capacity. All right, so innovation around language, I think we can all see where that is. And so here's my particulars again, if you wanna contact me, best way is email ed.clessatverisage.com. Um, in addition to the evaluation that I'm sure you're going to do for the conference, if so, so those of you wouldn't mind just going to ed, uh, ed edcless.com slash eval. Uh, I would love for that. I'm going to just put two ch quick chats in here, one with the soul of enterprise and then uh, one, whoop, it did not, it doesn't want to take my thing, but you guys get where it is. All right. Thanks so much, Amy, back to you. Thanks, Ed. That was such an amazing keynote. And I have to say, you hit the nail on the head by changing training to education, because that's what we try to do here at AccuConnect. So I loved all those. And I feel like you could take, I'll use a lot of those from my marketing background. I could use a lot of those and transform some of the ways I send out my messaging. So thank you so much for being our keynote speaker, kicking off day one. We truly do appreciate it.